sweep away my pain bring your healing to my heart help me love once again cares and worries get me down fear of failure fills my day when i'm lost and all alone help me lord to find your way people knocking at my door strangers seeking love and care never let me turn them me gently how to share children come into my life with your laughter and your song when will i become like them teach me lord to sing alone Hello dear friends, welcome to each and every one of you. Now we begin with a new session. Practically, even though it is not a new book, but it is considered as a separate work. And we are going to deal with 2nd Isaiah. Remember what we said earlier. The book of Isaiah contains practically the works or the prophecies of three prophets. First Isaiah, second Isaiah and third Isaiah. And this division was done practically in the 18th century because scholars were always discussing on this fact that there are so many dissimilarities that we find in the book of Isaiah between the chapters. Chapters 1 to 39 speaks of some important themes, but these are not the important themes in chapters 40 to 55. And again, chapters 56 to 66 again has another theme. And it is because of that the authors consider that these are three books, but combined together. But at the same time, we can say there is a continuity of thought also. The word of God, practically we can say, evolves and gives out a clear message. And in the first one, it is mainly about the punishment given to the people for their disobedience. But here and there, in chapters 1 to 39, we find God is promising that there would be a restoration. And how that restoration or salvation comes to be effected. And this is explained in chapters 40 to 55. And therefore, we can see the first Isaiah is different from second Isaiah in the themes and so on. And in the historical background, 
the events narrated the themes the literary style everything are different and therefore it is quite fitting that these books are separated even though there is a continuity we deal with the second book of isaiah and the third book of isaiah and therefore this is in general we can say in the first isaiah we saw god will restore them the promise is given but how that restoration occurs and this is explained in chapters 40 to 55 and it is mainly by exposing the work accomplished by a particular figure it is uh, called the servant of god or suffering servant of god he is the one who will atone for the sins of the people and re- redeem them thus their salvation and restoration would be complete this story is narrated in these chapters 40 to 55 and of course we can see the most important emphasis is given to the suffering servant figure and his work of salvation or work of redemption and we will come to see that there will be a couple of uh, themes to be dealt with as we go through the text you will study about it and the most important portion in this text is usually said to be four hymns and these are called servant songs in chapters 42 then 49 50 52 and 53 52 and 53 together these servant songs they convey the method the modality how god saves humanity what is his plan how he is accomplishing it all this will be narrated in these four servant songs therefore these are the important teachings in this book and this book is called the book of consolation why that name is given the name is given because of one fact it is in this book that we find how the consolation given by god reaches his people israel how the people of israel are saved how they are consoled in the midst of their suffering in the midst of their difficulties crisis and so on therefore this is what we can say and the salvation offered by god through the suffering servant is really the basis of salvation of humanity and we will try to uh, understand and we will try to develop that theme later and now a couple of introductory remarks on this book as we said it is known as second isaiah and also called a book of consolation and here we find god's promises are fulfilled 
and the liberation from the exile is the first stage of the deliverance, salvation. We know the people were taken to exile in 597 and 587. From 587, they remained about for 50 years in Babylon. And it was in 537, they were allowed to come back to Jerusalem. Thus, we see 50 years of exile. And that is usually said of uh, their redemption. And once they are allowed to return from exile, their hope strengthens. And they are now convinced that God will really save them and give them whatever he has promised. And thus we find God is consoling them after making them suffer for their sins. Restoration, salvation will come now. Therefore, this is the way how we have to understand about the second Isaiah. And that is why it is called a, the book of consolation. God is consoling Israel. And who is the instrument for this? It starts with Cyrus, the Persian emperor, who gave them the freedom to return. And therefore we can see Cyrus is the instrument the hands of God to begin the process of restoration. And Cyrus is called in the Bible sometimes my servant Cyrus. And therefore he is one who is dear to God. You can say. And now a troubling question is this. Why it is called second Isaiah? We already mentioned that there are differences in different realms between first Isaiah and second Isaiah. Literary forms used, the literary style, the themes which are emphasized and so on are different. But at the same time there is a continuity. Therefore, the name Isaiah befits this work. And that may be the reason why it was known as Isaiah or a continuation of Isaiah. And we call it second Isaiah or the scholars call it second Isaiah because of the similarity. There is also dissimilarity. First of all, we can say about the dissimilarities. There is a difference of language and style. And the main the characters, the main theme are different. And the historical situations also are different. We have already seen the historical background of first Isaiah. It is the reign of King Ahaz and Hezekiah. From 740 BC or 740 BC to 685 BC. The ministry of first Isaiah. But second Isaiah, we do not know exactly the period of ministry. But at the same time we see that it is during the exile and that is acknowledged by every scholar. And therefore, 
the historical background the period of history differs for both and the literary style and so on is different when we go through the text you will understand it and again we can see in the first isaiah jerusalem is the center where everything takes place but in second isaiah practically no place is mentioned but we can see that it is taking place in the place of their exile in babylon and therefore the people are now in exile and the situation is that of exilic situation the people are suffering in that exile whereas in the first the people are enjoying they are having a good time but here we find it is a real really troubled time you can see and in second i in first i say we will find people were not very strict with regard to monotheism most of them had an attitude of religious syncretism accepted different gods at the same time accepted yahweh and also the gods of babylon gods of egypt and so on and here in second isaiah it is strictly monotheistic only yahweh appears on the scene and therefore in theological content and outlook <clears throat> the first and second isaiah are entirely different you can say and another great importance is with regard to the concept of the messiah we see in the first isaiah messiah is a royal figure who is to be born in the line of david and the qualities needed for him are enumerated especially in the messianic prophecies and he will come as a ruler as a king and that is why he is called a royal messianic figure or royal messiah but when we come to the second isia we have a totally different concept of the concept of the messiah here messiah is one who suffers for no cause of his but for the atonement of our sins he suffers for our sins and iniquities and he practically atones for them and achieves salvation for us and therefore we can see in the second isaiah this is what we can say then the first isaiah the messiah is called the royal messiah we said whereas in the second isaiah the messiah will be called the suffering servant messiah or suffering servant of yahweh and that is his title in a way and therefore in the concept in the title and in the nature and in the function both are entirely different and therefore the different names are given in first isaiah and second isaiah for the messiah and in the first isaiah we find the characteristic features of the royal messiah narrated and he has wisdom knowledge 
is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, and he is having superhuman powers and he is able to understand the heart and mind of man and thus we find he is accredited with superhuman powers. But in Second Asia we find the suffering servant is one who suffers. He is helpless. His situation is pathetic. And he is unable to overcome this. He has to offer his life as a ransom for many. Therefore, the nature of the suffering is different. And in Second Isaiah, we find he is the one who suffers and through the suffering saves humanity. Therefore, that is the important difference between the first and second Isaiah, especially with regard to the concept of the Messiah. In second Isaiah, the suffering is emphasized and it is through the suffering the salvation of humanity is achieved. Whereas in the first, that is not the subject matter. There the king who rules ideally is the subject matter. And we can also say that the second Isaiah is written with an exodus motive, a new exodus. Here, there is a journey from liberty to freedom, a journey from death to life, we can say, just as the people had their journey from Egypt to Palestine. In the same way, we can see here too, a journey, and it is a new exodus. And sometimes you will see that the terminology is used for the first exile is or are being used for the second Isaiah 2. Thus we see even the terminology is used refer to a new exodus. And thus we can say the new exodus motive is very strong and prevalent in the second Isaiah. And the imageries presented are also different. In first Isaiah, the glory, the majesty, the grandeur of the royal king is presented. But just the opposite is presented with regard to the suffering servant in the second book of Isaiah. Thus we find there is a total change here. And now how to say that the second Isaiah depicts a new exodus? As you already mentioned, the imageries and the terminologies used in Second Isaiah give that picture. Sometimes it will be said, the usage of the words, getting out of the land, march forward, and all these can be considered to be referring to a kind of exodus. And again, passing through the desert is said to be 
or qualified to be marching through the desert. Of course, we know going through the desert is not a marching, but the terminology used is that marching through the desert. And therefore, we can say many of the terminologies used here in Second Isaiah would give us a hint on the second Exodus. And that is the reason why we it is mentioned. And the fertility of the land will be great. It will supersede even the fertility of the land of Palestine. Therefore we can see the new will surpass the old. And once they arrive at their destination, we know Palestine was their destination, the first and second Palestine, but specifically Jerusalem is the city of destination. And new here when they come, we can see it is a new Jerusalem and not the old, old Jerusalem. And the land of Judah and Jerusalem refer to a new land, a new city, the new city of Jerusalem. And the speciality of this city is that it can accommodate all who choose to come there. It has no limits practically. That is what is the meaning of this. And therefore, the usages convey this great picture before our mind. And there is also a mediator here. In the first Exodus, we know Moses was the mediator and it was through him the law was given and so on. And in the second Exodus, we can say the mediatorship is practically given to King Cyrus of Persia. And that is the reason why he is called my servant. And therefore we can see the concept of the second Isaiah. Or the concept that is given in the second Isaiah is about the suffering servant who achieves the salvation of humanity through suffering. Therefore, this is the way how we can understand about it. And what exactly is the background of the suffering servant story or the revelation? When the people of Israel went into exile, they had a very severe crisis situation. There was a crisis situation with regard to their faith, with regard to their social status and their political status. We know yesterday they were free, a free nation, and today they are totally slaves. Yesterday, they were very good in their social status. They were enjoying the riches of life, leading a good life, enjoyable life and so on. But now, they are just slaves. They do not get even what is sufficient to eat. Hence we can say, in the social status, they are totally different. Yesterday they were rich and today they are poor. 
and totally poor or drastically poor we can say. And with regard to the faith again we can say there were severe crisis situations that evolved here. And this crisis situation with regard to faith were based on a few questions and the basic question was is God unfaithful to his promises and what does it mean? We find from our studies earlier God had promised a couple of things to the people of Israel and Judah and what are these promises? And the first promise we can say it is about the city of Jerusalem. This is my city and I will protect it and nobody will destroy it. And secondly with regard to the temple this is my dwelling place on earth. No power on earth will prevail over it. Nobody can destroy the temple because I choose to live there. And thirdly, about the Davidic dynastic promise, God had solemnly promised David that his son will sit on the throne of Judah forever. But now there is no son of Judah, son of David, sorry, uh, son of David on the throne of David. There is no throne practically we can say. No more dynasty, no more city, no more capital and no more throne for the king. And thus we find the people are tempted to ask such a question. And what is the basic question? Is God really faithful to his promises or is he unfaithful to his promises? Therefore, this is one of the important questions raised by the people. And it was a troubling question. They found it difficult to believe that Yahweh is faithful to his promises or Yahweh is keeping his promises and so on. This is the way how we can understand it. And therefore, we can see that Yahweh is really or Yahweh would seem to be unfaithful to his promises. And that is what the people of Judah thought about God's promises at that time. Thus we find a severe blow to the belief the people had until now. And now their belief is challenged. How can God allow this to happen? That is the question raised by them. Okay, therefore this is just one part of the faith crisis. There are other things too which we have to discuss and in the coming session we will deal with it, the remaining portions of the faith crisis. Okay, thank you. Loving God, we thank you for the blessing of reading your word together. We ask that these words of life, truth and hope would continue to impact us in the days ahead. May your love and grace follow each of us, refreshed and blessed by you. Amen. Thank you.